Good morning. God is good all the time. Amen. Amen. Hey, it's good to see you today. Thanks for coming to church this morning. And uh, it's a beautiful Sunday. The sun's shining. The weather's warming up. Might be a good few days. We're we're glad to see that. Hey, uh, before I jump into the message this morning, I want to just share um, with you uh, about an opportunity you have today. Um, We've done this at Grace many years. I, I haven't put a lot of I'm not going to share a lot about it today, um, um, but um, at the beginning of the year, for the last several years, we've received a first fruits offering, and the first fruits is saying, God, I want to come and bring you the first and the best of the year so that the whole would be blessed. In Romans, it talks about that the first fruits are blessed so that the whole lump is holy, and um, you know, our, we're just coming and bringing something to the Lord out of our hearts. And so this is something that's uh, beyond our regular giving that we just sow into the kingdom. And uh, it doesn't just come to our church. It, we use it to send out to missions uh, all over, uh, all throughout the year, things that happen throughout the world, different needs that arise with our missionaries. We were able to take our first fruits offering and bless people with that. And so um, I'm not going to do a big, a whole long teaching on uh, this this morning um, but there's, there's some principles that are really good to learn about. And if you haven't, there's an email that I sent out this morning. It was supposed to go out. I forgot to send it out Thursday, so it went out today. And um, it went out this morning, and there's, there's a, a really good teaching about first fruits and the principle of the first in the Bible. And uh, I, I would encourage you to read through that in your email and just ask the Holy Spirit, what would you have me do? Is there anything you'd have me to do? Whenever it comes to giving here at Grace, we always tell you, just ask the Holy Spirit and ask him to help you in your giving and uh, how you might do this. But uh, this week, we're receiving a first fruits offering. You can use your offering envelope to do that. You can give online at carnegrace.com, and there's a, a first fruits drop-down tab there. Um, those kind of things that you want to do to, hey, so, to say, Lord, here at the beginning of the year, I'm sowing into the kingdom and just acknowledging everything I have is yours. It's already yours, and so I'm giving it to you today and uh, just being obedient to what he might say. So check out the email, and, uh, and you can do that as well. All right, turn your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 24. 1 Samuel chapter 24. I don't even have a page number for you if you can grab the Bible down front, but it's uh, um, towards the beginning of the Bible. Flip until you find 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 24. As you're turning, i got a question for you this morning. If someone from the community came up to you and said, hey, what are you doing at Grace this year? What would your answer be? Learning how to lead, but I heard it over here is a better phrase. Make the community livable. Say it with me. Make the community livable. Hey, what are you doing at Grace? We are making the community livable. What's that mean? We don't know. We're going to figure it out somewhere. But listen, our job is to be invested in the community. In Jeremiah 29, we've been sharing out of this uh, passage of Scripture and how in Jeremiah 29, the Israelites were in captivity. And in that place of captivity, God said to multiply there, do not decrease. He said, pray for the peace of the city, for when it has peace, you will have peace. When it thrives, you will thrive. In other words, we're supposed to be invested in our community. So what are we doing at Grace? We're making the community livable. And uh, when those Israelites were in captivity, they had been drugged all the way to Babylon. And when they were in captivity, their leader of the Babylonians, King Nebuchadnezzar, he said, hey, let's, uh, let's grab some young Hebrew boys. Let's train them in our cultures and our traditions. And let's convince them that our pagan worship is better than their worship of Yahweh so that we can influence the generations to come because these Hebrews, these millions of Hebrews that are with us, are going to be, become Babylonians and we're going to get them to stop worshiping God. That's what they said. We're going to do this by changing their names. We're going to define their identity. We're going to, we're going to determine their standards, the standards that they live by, and we're going to dictate their worship. And we're going to do those things. We're going, to, we're going to define their identity, determine their standards, and dictate their worship. But guess what? It didn't work. It didn't work because those boys stood for their faith. And as they stood, God moved in their life. And they moved in leadership in different places throughout the culture. Daniel was in leadership in the government for 40 years. For 40 years. Leading in a pagan culture, yet not surrendering his godly values. They all knew who he worshipped. There was not a question about it. 
It wasn't that he was a closet Christian working in the government. He was, everybody knew, he's a worshiper of God, of Yahweh. And he was leading. And what he was doing was making the community livable in that place. And that's what we're called to do. That's why we want to develop our leadership so we can make the community livable. What are you guys doing at Grace this year? There we go. Come on. Last week, we started looking at the life of David, and we're going to look at David for the next several weeks. And um, David it was, uh, was a leader, but he had to be patient to get to the place where he stepped into fulfillment of what God had promised in his life. As a young teenager, he was called and anointed. He was anointed to be king, yet it was 20 years till he stepped into the place where he became king. There was a place where he had to be patient and waiting for that. But as he was waiting, he took his gifts that he had, and when someone asked him to use his gifts, he used them. He used his gift of playing the lyre or the harp for King Saul whenever he was being tormented by evil spirits. He would go and bless him so that the presence of God would come into that place. And he was a minstrel unto King Saul that would bring him into the presence of God. One day, as his brothers were off on the front lines fighting the the Philistines along there with King Saul, they were fighting the Philistines, and his dad said, David was the youngest of the brothers, his dad said, hey, bring some snacks to your brothers on the front lines. Bring them some snacks. And so he brought him some, and when he got there, he could not understand how this army, this Israeli army, the Hebrew people, how they were standing in intimidation, living in intimidation, by the giant Goliath. And David said, sign me up. My God will remove this mockery. Because Goliath was making a mockery of God. And what happened? David defeated Goliath. And Saul said, who's this young man who so valiantly responded? Whose son is he? And Saul found out and he brought him into his palace to serve with him and to serve in his armies. But the people, they heard this story about Goliath, and they said, they started singing this song, and they said, David, or Saul has killed his thousands, and David has killed his ten thousands. And because of that, jealousy began to grow in the heart of Saul. Maybe there's an important leadership lesson that's not in my notes here, that sometimes when we see the gifts that are happening with a younger generation, we would rather squelch those gifts out of jealousy then promote them into a place where God has positioned them to be. Jealousy drove Saul to attempt to kill David. One day when David was playing his harp, trying to help King David be released from that evil spirit, that evil spirit overcame Saul and he took that spear and threw it across the room, stuck in the wall and just missed David's head. Tried to kill him right there. This David had to flee from King Saul. I wonder what David was thinking in those moments. Like, hey, I'm the anointed one, I'm the king, but this guy, this Saul, he keeps trying to kill me. And Saul thinks, then Saul thinks maybe he can trap David. And so he takes his daughter, Michael, who was in love with David, and said, yes, you can marry him. Like, now you'll become my son-in-law, I'm gonna trap you, and so I'm gonna take away your power. But David continued to serve in the army and continued to battle and became even more successful until Saul came into, this, into the full kill David mode. I'm going to kill him. Saul forgot about everything else that was happening, all the other armies, and his only, his only mission was to go after David. Saul put a bounty on his head, doing everything he could to chase after David. And Saul is no longer pursuing the enemies of Israel, but his personal enemy, David. David's on the run. Saul's going crazy, and David runs into the wilderness or into the desert, Down by the Dead Sea, down by the Dead Sea, there is a little oasis called En Gedi. And in En Gedi is this nature reserve even today. I've been there and I've seen these waterfalls that run through the desert down to the Dead Sea. And there's this beautiful kind of lush ground and oasis. There's water. Anytime there's water in the desert, that's a good thing. There's water there, and there's some, some wild goats there, and there's some other animals that are there, still there today. And up in the hillside in this, in this nature reserve are these caves. There's hundreds and hundreds of these caves like this that 
people would go and climb into, and you had to climb up to a cave a lot of, a lot of the time to do what? Protect yourself so you could sleep safely at night. Nobody would know you were in the cave. It was a good place to be. David is hanging out in a cave one night, one, one day, and King Saul and his troops arrive there. And I want to read this story, out, story to you. We're going to read a couple chapters out of the Bible today. And I want to read to you out of 1 Samuel chapter 24. You can follow along with me. Verse 1. When Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told, David is in the wilderness near En Gedi. So Saul took 3,000 of Israel's fit young men and went to look for David and his men in front of the rocks of the wild goats. When Saul came to the sheep, the sheep pens along the road, a cave was there, and he went in to relieve himself. He went to go to the bathroom. David, David and his men were staying in the recesses of the cave. So Saul walks into this cave to go to the bathroom, probably for some privacy. Little as he know, David and his men are further back in the cave. Verse 4, so they said to him, the men said to David, look, this is the day the Lord told you about. I will hand your enemy over to you so you can go do to him whatever you desire. Then David got up and secretly cut off the corner of Saul's robe. Afterward, David's conscience both bothered him because he had cut off the corner of Saul's robe. He said to his men, I swear before the Lord, I would never do such a thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed. I will never lift my hand against him since he is the Lord's anointed. With these words, David persuaded his men and he did not let them rise up against Saul. Then Saul left the cave and went on, went on his way. After that, David got up, went out of the cave, and called to Saul, My Lord, the king. When Saul looked behind him, David knelt low with his face to the ground and paid homage. David said to Saul, Why do you listen to the words of people who say, Look, David intends to harm you? Why do you listen to those lies? You can see with your own eyes the Lord handed you over to me in this cave. Someone advised me to kill you. But I took pity on you and said, I won't lift my hand against the Lord since he is the Lord's anointed. Look, my father, look at the corner of your robe in my hand, for I cut it off, but I didn't kill you. Recognize that I've committed no crime or rebellion. I haven't sinned against you, even though you are hunting me down to take my life. May the Lord judge between me and you, and may the Lord take vengeance on you, but my hand will never be against you. As the old proverb says, wickedness comes from wicked people. My hand will never be against you. Who has the king of Israel come after? What are you chasing after? A dead dog? A single flea? May the Lord be judge and decide between you and me. May he take notice and plead my case and deliver me from you. When David finished saying these things to him, Saul replied, Is that your voice, David, my son? Then Saul wept aloud and said to David, You are more righteous than I, for you have done what is good to me, though I have done what is evil to you. You yourself have told me today what good you did for me when the Lord handed me over to you. You didn't kill me. When a man finds his enemy, does he let him go unharmed? May the Lord repay you with good for what you've done for me today. Now I know for certain you will be king, and the kingdom of Israel will be established in your hand. Therefore swear to me by the Lord that you will not cut off my descendants or wipe out my name from my father's family. So David swore to Saul. Then Saul went back home, and David and his men went up the stronghold. So here we go. What's going on here? I mean, in the world we live in, when you have the opportunity to take the enemy out, you take the enemy out. Isn't that the culture we live in? If you have an opportunity to cut somebody out, you cut them out. If somebody's been exposed, if somebody's done something wrong, and you can get on social media and share with the whole world what they've done wrong, that's what you should do. That's what the world says. If you have a chance to take somebody out, take them out. David has this chance right here to take out King Saul, who had been hurling insults at him and even trying to kill him. But something greater was going on. And here's the lesson I want to share with you in leadership today. It's this, that, that to be a great leader, we need to love and listen. We need to love and listen. David's love for the Lord would not deter him. He was not going to violate the Lord. He knew Saul was anointed, and he would not touch the Lord's anointed even when everything was against him. David's love for the Lord put a sense of resolve and trust in his heart that he was not going to take the throne by his own hand. And so King Saul says, you are more righteous than I, for you have done what is good to me, though I have done what is evil to you. Saul was responding to the love that was on display through David. He was responding to love. Why didn't Saul turn around and just go after David right then? Because love was in the midst of it. 
What is the opposite of love? Fear. Fear is the opposite of love. When fear drives you as a leader, you make poor decisions. When fear drives you, you don't make good decisions. We lash out. We hurt others. We're selfishly motivated. And fear only creates anxiety, worry, and doubt. Fear. I've had my own battles with fear and leadership this week and had to get myself under the umbrella of love so that I could lead effectively. Listen, some time goes by here. So King Saul says he responds to love. Fear gets put out of his heart, and he lets David go, and he goes back to, back to Jerusalem. And while he's there, he starts hearing stories again about David. Jealousy starts ramping up again. He gets mad again. Fear starts to run over him. The love he'd received from Dev, David is washed away by fear. He can't take it any longer, and he goes back on the hunt for David. Turn to chapter 26. We're going to read one more chapter here. Verse 1, then the Zippites came to Saul at Gibeah saying, David is hiding on the hill of Hakalah opposite Jessamon. Maybe that's how you pronounce them. So Saul, accompanied by 3,000 of the fit young men of Israel, went immediately to the wilderness of Zip to return to search for David there. Saul camped beside the road at the hill of Hakalah opposite Jessamon. David was living in the wilderness and discovered Saul had come there after him. So here's, David realizes, here's Saul coming after me again. Surely now's the time. So David sent out spies and knew for certain that Saul had come. Immediately, David went to the place where Saul had camped. He saw the place where Saul and Abner, son of Ner, the commander of his army, were lying down. Saul was lying inside the inner circle of the camp with the troops camped around him. So 3,000 men, that's a big chunk of people. King Saul's in the middle of those 3,000 people, right? They're, They're supposed to protect him. Then David asked Ahimelech, the Hethite, and Joab's brother Abishai, son of Zariah, who will go with me to the camp of Saul? I'll go with you, answered Abishai. (laughs) Who's going to go with me into these 3,000 men? Abishai says, I'll go with you. So that night, David and Abishai came to the troops, and Saul was lying there asleep in the inner circle of the camp with his spear stuck in the ground by his head. Abner and the troops were lying around him. Then Abishai said to David, Today God has delivered your enemy to you. Let me thrust the spear through him into the ground just once. I won't have to strike him twice. But David said to Abishai, Don't destroy him, for who can lift a hand against the Lord's anointed and be innocent? And I don't know, what was David thinking? Why was he going there? Why was he sneaking into the camp? Was was he like, man, I'm going to take him out? But when he got there and he recognized the anointing, was he like, I can't do this? Sometimes we make those decisions that aren't the best and we find ourselves in a place that's like, you don't have to follow through with that. You don't have to do it. Verse 10, David added, as the Lord lives, the Lord will certainly strike him down. Either his day will come and he will die or he will go into battle and perish. However, because of the Lord, I will never lift my hand against the Lord's anointed. Instead, take the spear and the water jug by his head and let's go. So David took the spear and the water jug by Saul's head and they went their way. No one saw them, no one knew And no one woke up. Well, that was a miracle in itself. They all remained asleep because a deep sleep from the Lord came over them. David crossed to the other side and stood on top of the mountain at a distance. There was a considerable space before it between them. Then David shouted to the troops and to Abner, son of Ner, Aren't you going to answer, Abner? Who are you who calls to the king, Abner asked. David called to Abner, You're a man, aren't you? Who in Israel is your equal? So why didn't you protect the Lord your king when one of the people came to destroy him? What you have done is not good. As the Lord lives, all of you deserve to die since you didn't protect your Lord, the Lord's anointed. Now look around. Where are the king's spear and the water jug that were by his head? Saul recognized David's voice and asked, Is that your voice, my son David? It is my voice, my Lord and king, David said. Then he continued, Why is my Lord pursuing his servant? What have I done? What what crime have I committed? Now may the Lord, the king, please hear the words of his servant. If it is the Lord who has incited you against me, then may he accept an offering. If I've done something wrong, then I'll I'll, I'll give an offering right here. But if it is people, may they be found cursed in the presence of the Lord, for today they have banished him, me, from sharing in the inheritance of the Lord, saying, go and worship other gods. So don't let my blood fall to the ground 
far from the Lord's presence. For the king of Israel has come out to search for a single flea, like one who pursues a partridge in the mountains. Like, how are you even finding me out here? Saul responded, I have sinned. Come back, my son David. I will never harm you again, because today you consider my life precious. I have been a fool. I've committed a grave error. David answered, here is the king's spear. Have one of the young men come over and get it. The Lord will repay every man for his righteousness and his loyalty. I wasn't willing to lift my hand against the Lord's anointed, even though the Lord handed you over to me today. Just as I considered your life valuable today, so may the Lord consider my life valuable and rescue me from all trouble. Saul said to him, you are blessed, my son David. You will certainly do great things and will prevail. Then David went on his way and Saul returned home. Once again, David has an opportunity. Just take Saul out. The people who loved him, who were there with him, Abishai, take him out and you can go sit on the throne that God has anointed you for. Just take him, David. That was the voice of those closest to him. Sometimes the voices closest to us don't give us wisdom. David, he discerned, even though the voices of those closest to him were telling him to take Saul out, he would not budge from the integrity for the, of the Lord in his heart. It wasn't going to happen this week, this way. Last week, we talked about God's leader requires patience. God's leader requires patience. Today, we're talking about God's leader requires humility. Humility. It's easy to think that I'm in charge. I have the answers and feed ourselves with pride. But humility is the ingredient of a great leader. Wherever you are leading, let humility drive you. Humility is a choice. It's a posturing of our heart before the Lord that reminds ourselves that God is in charge, that he's the ruler, that his authority reigns supreme, that his dominion is the place in which I live, that my position is under his authority, that he is Lord, that he's Lord. We spent all of last year talking about dominion, being under the authority of the Lord. And when you're under the authority of the Lord, you actually have joy in your life. In order to be God's leader, we need to be under his authority, and that means we walk in humility. David's humility allowed him to be anointed king in one moment, and the very next moment to be shepherding sheep out in the pasture. He was confident to wait for God's timing. The story we just read, there's a couple things we can glean from that. In verse 17, it says, Saul recognized David's voice and asked, Is that your voice, my son David? It is my voice, my Lord and King David said. Then he continued, Why is my Lord pursuing his servant? What have I done? What crime have I committed? Here's the first thing I want you to know. A humble heart is willing to listen. A humble heart's willing to listen. Why ask questions? Why was David asking him questions? To show humility and to listen. In order to be a good leader, we have to develop the skill and ability to listen. God's leader requires listening. God's leader requires listening. Not just to words, not to formulate my response, but to listen to the heart, to gain insight and understanding, to demonstrate compassion and care. Leaders earn the right. A leader will earn the right to speak into the lives of their people. Why? Because they listen. They display love compassion and understanding. And listen, last week I reminded you that leadership is not about being in charge of something. Leadership is, is simply bringing God into the place where he's given you influence to help somebody. Help somebody. We can lead in all kinds of places. A husband leads by listening to his wife when she is frustrated. He listens to gain understanding, not just information, but to find ways to love her in response. The understanding will help him love her. A wife leads by listening to her husband when he is distant. She listens to gain understanding and finds, finds ways to honor him in response. A boss leads by listening to their employees regarding the conditions they are working in. A boss will lead by actually listening to their employees not just ignoring them and saying, well, it was never like that before and I don't understand what you're talking about and just go get the job done. No, there's a place of listening that needs to take place. A coach leads by listening to their players describe what's happening on the field. 
A good coach will listen to what well, this is what's going on. Just because I guess because I told you the play should work, it might not be because you're not seeing and experiencing what that player is on the field. Listening is not dictating, and listening is not caving into whatever someone is sharing with you. I love the statement from Stephen Covey when he says this: "Seek first to understand, then to be understood." Seek first to understand, that's listening, then to be understood, that's good communication. When we lead by listening, something happens. When we lead by listening, we gain clarity of someone else's experience, of their personal experience. You get clarity. And once you get clarity, we lead by listening, by having the opportunity to clarify our, ex- our expectations and the viewpoints that we have. Many times we think leadership is simply clarifying my expectations and telling you what I think over and over and over and just running over you. Leadership is actually listening to help someone so you can get clarity on somebody else's experience so you can help them by then sharing and clarifying what your expectations are. God's leaders listen and love. When you listen, you are displaying genuine love. Leaders and listeners, leaders are listeners, and we listen because we love. Listen, we love because God first loved us, and we realize that every person first and foremost is loved by God, and we want to connect with that person. Now listen, I understand every moment's not the same. Not, it's not every moment isn't the right time to listen. In places we're working or we're getting things done, and we can't always take time to listen. We need to give direction about what needs to be done and the work that needs to be done. But if we, if we don't find time and the places to listen, we will have a hard time leading. If I come home every night and it's just about the busyness, I, re- I remember these days well with four young boys at home. I can come home and there's chaos going on in the house and we got to get supper ready and we got to work on homework and we, we got to get the things done before it's time for them to go to bed and we got to take care of things. We got to run to the ball game and then we got to go there and we got to do this and it's go, 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 go. And if it's just about the busyness, we'll miss out on an opportunity. We'll miss out on the opportunity to listen. And when we, when we don't take time to listen, we fail to display love. We stop leading, and listen to this, we start enslaving. If we don't listen, we won't display love, we'll stop leading, and we'll start enslaving. Nobody wants to be enslaved to a leader, whether that's a boss at a place you work, a parent, a friend, nobody wants to be enslaved. When we listen, We display genuine love. I'm going to give you four things about genuine love, and then I'm quickly going to give you seven things about listening. So I hope you're taking notes. Here's some things that John Maxwell says about genuine love. Genuine love is not always popular. It's not always popular. It's not as popular to love. David's men, these men that were with him, they were disgruntled. They were tired of running from Saul. So when David had his opportunity, twice, they told him, both times, Just kill him now. Let's get this over with. Take your place as king and let's get the show on the road. That's what they, I mean, we all have those kind of people, right, in our lives. It's not popular to display genuine love. So many times we see this happen over and over. Well, somebody will be anointed and gifted and they'll get the wrong people's ears, voices in their ear, and they get the wrong voices and not being able to discern it. What they'll do is undercut leadership to try to take over leadership. David had plenty of opportunities to undercut leadership. He never undercut the leadership. Even when Saul was doing evil things, because we think that's a good reason to undercut leadership. No, he put it in God's hands. He said, God will remove Saul when it's my time. We see this happen over and over, all the time. Like, hey, let's don't show love to somebody. Let's don't show grace. Let's make sure we take all of their junk, all of their sin, and throw it out for the world to see. Let's undercut their leadership. It's happening in politics every day. Let's expose something. It happens in with coaches in sports. It happens with parenting. It happens with leadership in the church. It happens all over the place. Let's expose it. Let's get on social media and let's blast it out there. Listen, that's not genuine love. Genuine love is not popular. It's not popular to, you know, we shouldn't sit in a place of judgment over somebody because I can get on the internet and throw it out, out there whatever I want. You know what? I don't know what's going on in their life. It's not my part to do that. As a leader, 
I can protect my people, but there's no reason why I need to undercut the entire world. There's leaders in the church doing it left and right, where they want to just throw entire things under the bus that they know nothing about. It happens in businesses, where people will come and just take something away. They'll rally their troops together and inform some people and say, you know what, I can do the job better than you are, and so I'm going to start my own company and go over here, and I'm going to take some of those people with me. It's not popular to wait, is it? But here's David displaying genuine love by being different. By being different. Genuine love is not popular. In this culture, if we want to, if we want to make the community livable, what does that mean? It means to be different. Display genuine love that's not popular. When somebody has fallen, help them get back up. Love them. If they're repentant, bring them in and love them well. Be different. The second thing is this. Genuine love needs clear perspective. It needs clear perspective. The second time David was with Saul, the second chapter we read about, in the middle of the night, while Saul is sleeping, David goes and takes his spear and his water jug, and then from a distance, he called to the king. And he humbled himself and asked for perspective. He said, what have I done? What have I done? What crime have I committed? He needed perspective so much that he said, I will even, if I've done something wrong, if I've committed a crime, I will offer a sacrifice right now. I will repent of that right now. Would you, would you just tell me? He was asking questions, what have I done wrong? He was gaining perspective. And when you gain clear perspective, you love people correctly until you see them clearly with God's eyes, Genuine love needs clear perspective. Be humble. Be humble. The third one is this. Genuine love is not defensive. Wow, that's hard for all of us right there. Every one of us struggle with this. David was in a difficult position, but he knew God was allowing this situation for a purpose, and he trusted God to deliver him. In his humility, David offers to make the sacrifice If he's harmed Saul or done anything wrong, he waits to hear Saul's rationale. Impatience indicates we lack trust and want our rights. When I'm being defensive, it's about my rights. Listen, genuine love is not defensive. Be patient. Be patient. And the last one is this. Genuine love is powerful. It's popular. It needs clear perspective. It's not defensive. It's powerful. Saul later apologizes to David and admits he's wrong, and he promises to go home. Listen, David's in the driver's seat here. He's in the driver's seat. He still has Saul's spear and his water jug. Those were lifelines in the desert. If you didn't have the water jug, you were going to die out there in the desert. Just getting back from En Gedi to Jerusalem or anywhere else through the Negev, if you didn't have your water jug, you were in trouble. And secondly, he needed the spear because there's wild animals out there that were going to need to be taken care of. It was to defend yourself and to live. They were lifelines, and David had them. He's in the driver's seat. They were necessary for survival. But David, instead of keeping them, David forgives Saul of everything. What a crazy concept. David forgives Saul. It's really the message of the gospel. Forgiveness. The world, what's the greatest need in the world today that will set captives free? Forgiveness. What will restore relationships? Forgiveness. What will heal wounds? Forgiveness. And here's David. He could have said, I'm right. This guy's tried to kill me twice. He's chasing after me all over for years. He's been chasing me. I should be the king. I should take his life out right now. He humbles himself. He doesn't take his life out. He displays genuine love to Saul, not once, but twice. So many of us are like, I loved you once, and then you came after me again. That's it. I draw the line at that. But he didn't just love him once. He loved him again. And then he said, hey, come and get your spear and your water jug. Genuine love is powerful. Be forgiving. Like David, we must trust God to make things right. Leaders are not jerks that are dictators who give endless lists of demands. Leaders change the culture by becoming great listeners and demonstrating genuine love. You have to write fast. I'm going to go through these seven things really quick. Proverbs 18, 13 says this, the one who gives an answer before he listens 
this is foolishness and disgrace for him. The one who gives an answer before he listens. In other words, if you don't seek first to understand, you just want to be understood. Let me give you the answer before you even ask the question. The one who gives an answer before he listens, seek first to understand. Otherwise, it's foolishness and disgrace for you. So here's how to listen and love. Here's how to be a great listener. Here's the first one. Initiate contact and set the stage for communication. Initiate contact. Who, who should initiate contact? The first person that realizes there's a problem. When you realize there's a problem with somebody, you should initiate contact and set the stage for communication. Proverbs 1 verse 5 says this, Let a wise person listen and increase learning, and let a discerning person obtain guidance. A wise person would say, I'm going to initiate contact, and I'm going to set the stage for communication, which starts with listening. Seek first to understand. The second thing is this, ask questions and listen. James 1.19, my dear brothers and sisters, understand this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. What did David do? He asked questions. He initiated. He could, he could have just fled. Both times he could have not even, not even talked to Saul. But he yells at him from a distance, and he's showing love. I could have taken your life out, and I didn't because I love you. It's not my time yet. What have I done wrong? And he starts asking questions. He initiated the communication. And he starts asking questions. And then, as you've asked questions, you're seeking first to understand. Then you have an opportunity to appeal to the other person's sense of right and wrong, which is the third one. To appeal to the other person's sense of right and wrong. Proverbs 23, 12 says, apply yourself to discipline and listen to words of knowledge. As a leader, you have knowledge to share back and you want to appeal to their sense of right and wrong. This might be going on, but let's talk about what might be right and what might be wrong. Initiate contact, ask questions, appeal. The fourth one is this, share your perspective. Seek first to understand, then be understood. Now I have a chance to share my perspective. Proverbs 12, verse 15 says, A fool's way is right in his own eyes, but whoever listens to counsel is wise. Is wise. Initiate contact, ask questions, appeal to the person's sense of right and wrong, share your perspective, and number five, own up to anything you have done wrong. Humility. Humility. As a leader, there's, it's, you're not a failure by admitting that you might have done something wrong. It's not failure. Proverbs 19.27, if you stop listening to correction, my son, you will stray from the words of knowledge. Listen for correction. Proverbs 15.31, one who listens to life-giving rebukes. Do you know what a rebuke could be life-giving? One who listens to life-giving rebukes will be at home among the wise. Initiate contact. Ask questions. Appeal to the person's sense of right and wrong. Share your perspective. Own up to anything you've done wrong. And number six, submit yourself to authority, which is simply submitting yourself to God. Submit yourself to authority. Wherever authority is at in your life, submit to it. Proverbs 8, 34, anyone who listens to me is happy, watching at my doors every day, waiting by the posts at my doorway. And the last thing is this, number seven, offer forgiveness and reconciliation as an act of trust in God. Offer forgiveness and reconciliation. A good leader is one who is willing to forgive and reconcile. That doesn't mean you will always be in a relationship. Doesn't mean if somebody's working for you, they'll always be working for you. You could actually initiate forgiveness and reconciliation and the job comes to an end. But a good leader, a good leader will initiate communication will ask questions, will appeal to the sense of right and wrong, will share their perspective, will own up to the things that they might have done wrong, they'll submit to authority, and they'll offer forgiveness and reconciliation. What if every day we made a conscious effort to listen instead of being heard? What if you made an effort to listen this week? What if you made it part of your life? I'm gonna make an effort to listen. And I know it's hard. It's a hard thing to do to stop and listen. What if we pick somebody out this week? Every day this week, you pick somebody out. You found somebody and you, you, you decided, I'm gonna go initiate contact with them. Not because you have a problem with them, just because they're somebody that's on your heart. I'm gonna initiate contact with them. 
and I'm going to simply listen. I'm not going to go with an agenda. I'm not going to invite them to coffee or lunch or breakfast or pick up the phone because I have an agenda, but rather because I just want to listen, and I want to build the skill of listening. What would that display? To simply listen, what would that display? Love. Love. It's how we lead to make the community livable. It starts with listening and loving. Listen, here's the statement for today, and it's, we're, we're, up, we're finally to the word L. I got a little acronym. We're on the L, which is under love. Leaders change the culture by becoming great listeners and demonstrating genuine love. Leaders change the culture by becoming great listeners and demonstrating genuine love. That's probably opposite of how we see leadership in the world. Leadership in the world does, wants to enslave people and tell them what to do. Good leaders change the culture. They make the community livable. What, what if the, what if the three, four hundred of us here at Grace, what if we decided at our place of work, what if we decided at our school, what if we decided at our home, what if we decided in our neighborhood, what if we decided when we do entertainment things, what if we decided to become great listeners and demonstrate genuine love? What would happen to the culture? As we close this morning, we've got about 10 more minutes, and I, I want to do something here. David was willing to forgive. Forgive Saul for everything that he'd been chased after. What a hard thing to do, to forgive. I want to tell you, forgiveness is not always because someone has said, I'm sorry. Forgiveness is about me having a right heart with God and making sure my vertical relationship with Him is good. Restoration of relationship can happen even without that, but it might need a more communication. There was a lady I was working with one day, a young girl, and she really struggled with her mom. Her, her home her, felt like her mom's words were unkind, felt like she was being demanding of her, all these things that kids think about their parents. And... Um, I said, what if we just walk through forgiveness? My mom will never tell me she's wrong. She'll never admit she's wrong. I said, yeah, she probably won't. But you're in bondage right now. You're in bondage because every time you think of your mom, all you do is get frustrated and bitter. She may never tell you she's sorry. She may never change. But Jesus forgave you before you were ever born. He didn't ask you to forgive, to ask for forgiveness. He already forgave you. He demonstrated forgiveness. Now you got to receive that. But she, I said, what if we went through an exercise and we, we forgave your mom? So we went through this exercise and had this big long list of all these grievances and we took them all to the Lord and we forgave her. Two weeks later, she went to go see her mom. She was dreading it. She was thinking, I don't know. But she was feeling peace in her heart. She went there. Her mom had not changed at all. Said the same things, did some of the same things, but it didn't bother her at all. 15 years later, she has a tremendous relationship with her mom. Not because her mom has admitted things and changed, but because she forgave. It's the principle of the gospel. Who do you need to forgive? We all have people we need to forgive. I had this amazing day in worship one day. I've shared about this before. I was here on a, in a morning, and I had worship music on. And it, was, it was pretty upbeat, and I was dancing and singing before the Lord. It, when nobody's around, that's when you're the freest in worship. You do whatever you want to do. Just worshiping and dancing and flailing around and jumping and yelling and praising God. And this song comes to an end and I'm exhausted physically. And had all this joy in me. And right here, I got down on my knees. This wooden thing wasn't here then. I got down on my knees at the altar here just because I was exhausted. And I heard this so clear in my spirit. I want you to pray for your enemies. I said, ha, 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 I don't have any enemies, God. I'm good. I just had this great encounter with him. Like, I'm good. And then three people, boom, 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 he brought to me. Boom, boom, boom. He's so kind. He's so kind. I just had this tremendous encounter with him. He's like, I know what you're going to need to forgive these people. I want you to pray for them. He said, I know you can't pray for them until you forgive them. Why don't you just give them back to me? 
Why don't you forgive them and give them back to me? So I said, God, I began to pray and I began to give these people back to him and forgive them. This burden came off me, this freedom came. The next time I saw those people, I didn't no longer had any wall between us. I was good. They never had to say they're sorry. They never had to make amends. I was good. Some of our relationships are better. Some are the same, but I'm free from that. I want to take a minute and give you an opportunity. That's why we have a couple extra minutes here. I want to give you an opportunity just to ask the Holy Spirit because he's faithful. You don't have to go digging for this. You just ask the Holy Spirit because he knows when the time is right. He may even bring somebody's name up of somebody that you think, well, I've already forgiven them, which you may have, but Jesus also says that there's this 70 times 7 principle that every time God brings it up, you just give it back to him. You might have some layers. This morning when I was, when I did this um, with the first service, God put a name on my heart that I was like, wow, I thought I'd forgiven him, but I needed to go through the process again. I just want to take a minute. Let's just bow your head. Just close your eyes. Just put your attention on the Lord. Don't miss this opportunity. Why don't you just ask Him? Holy Spirit, is there someone in my life that I've been harboring offense with, that I've got bitterness lodged in my soul with, that I simply need to forgive? Is there anybody, God, that uh, I just need to give back to you today so that I can be free, so I can lead in the way you want me to lead? given me so much, God. I just want to be obedient to you today. Is there anybody that I need to forgive? Just take a moment here. Just ask him now. in your heart. Caitlin, okay, I'm going to jump to verse 7. 1 John chapter 4. Dear friends, let us love one another because love is from God. And everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. The one who does not know, does not love, does not know God because God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his one and only son into the world so we might live through him. The only way we can forgive is living through him. Love consists in this. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Once you've received forgiveness, it makes it possible to forgive. Dear friends, if God loved us in this way, we also must love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God remains in us and his love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we remain in him and he in us. He has given of, uh, us of his spirit. And we have seen and we testify that the Father has sent his Son as the world's Savior. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God remains in him and he in God. And we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And the one who remains in love remains in God. And God remains in him. In this, love is made complete with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love. Instead, perfect love drives out fear because fear involves punishment. So the one who fears is not complete in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, and yet he hates his brother or sister, he is a liar. For the person who does not love his brother or sister whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And we have this command from him. The one who loves God must also love his brother and sister. Fear involves punishment. For some of us, we don't want to forgive because we want to punish someone. 
God says justice is his. It's his vengeance. Would you just do something with me? And just by an act of faith, you might not even be like, I don't feel like forgiving this person. That's okay. I don't, I don't feel like forgiving people a lot of times. But there's something supernatural that happens when I partner with God. And I just believe there's some freedom that's going to come to some of you right in this moment. I want you to take that person that, um, that God might have dropped in your heart. I just want everybody to pray this prayer with me. And we get to the name of the person and what they might have done. You don't have to say those things out loud. But let's just start by saying, just, just praying out loud. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you that you love me. I thank you for your love. I thank you that Jesus, you provided the atoning sacrifice for my life. You loved me. You brought me into your family. You forgave me. I'm so thankful that you forgave me. Father, I want to admit I have some fear in my life. It doesn't want me to forgive. But you forgave me of so much. I want to choose to forgive today. So by an act of my will, I partner with you. Holy Spirit, help me. I choose today to forgive. And whoever it is, fill in the blank. Choose to forgive them today, God, for whatever it might be. Choose to forgive them. I give them to you today, Father. Father, I give them to you and I just ask you God that as I lay them at your feet I forgive them and I ask you that you'd pull out any roots of bitterness that you'd pull out any any anything that that's been displaying in my life that's caused me to be sinful or hurtful or vengeful right now God I give them to you and I pray for them today God I pray that they would have an encounter with you God that you'd set them free God I pray God that you would bring strength to their life God, I not only forgive them today, but I pray for them right now. And I ask you, God, would you move in their life? Would you pour your love out upon them, Lord, that they would not be captive to fear, but your perfect love would cast out fear in their life. I ask you right now in the name of Jesus that as I forgive, that you'd pull out the root, God. You'd pull out the root of unforgiveness. You'd pull out the bitterness in this moment. I choose to forgive them. I release them of the punishment that is due them for their sin that's been against me. I release them of that punishment today, and I forgive them today. I release them to you today, God, and I ask you, Lord, that your love would come into my life and it be poured out over their lives as well. Lord, would you bring healing in my heart today as I forgive? I'm so thankful, God, that you have forgiven me, that you've set me free, and that you love me. And so now I ask you, God, as I've given you these people, as I've given you this unforgiveness as a gift, as a sacrifice, I've given it to you, God, and I've acknowledged what you've given me. God, I have a question for you. God, as I've given this to you, what do you have for me? I want you just ask him, if you forgave somebody out of your heart right now, I want you just ask him, Holy Spirit, what do you have for me? As I've forgiven, God's a good giver, he loves to give. As I've forgiven, what do you have for me? Just ask him. Father, we thank you that you partner with us. Lord, we thank you that you are for us and not against us. We thank you, Lord, that we have an opportunity to be powerful people, affecting the culture we live in by being forgiving. Help us, Lord, to be quick to forgive. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to ask you to be bold if you have something. We just gave something to God in forgiveness and we asked the Holy Spirit to give us something in return. As you ask the Holy Spirit that question, is there somebody here that would tell me what they told, what the Holy Spirit told you? Brian? Rest, peace, and joy. Sounds like good stuff. Yeah. Who else? Still waters. Praise God. Anybody else? 
what? A calm spirit. Every time you give God something and you ask for a return, he's got something to give you in return. God, when I did this first service, he brought somebody up that I, I thought I had forgiven. I probably have, but I still have some, probably still some stuff in my heart. And it um, happened many years ago, 13 so years ago, something that was said towards a family member, that hurt a family member, and that made me mad. And I, I, it took me a while. And I asked God, what do you have for me after I forgave him this morning, forgave that person this morning, and God gave me love. He said, I'm giving you love for them. I'm giving you love. So I have an opportunity to step out into that love the next time I see them, because I will, to bring reconciliation. As a matter of fact, I think this other person's been trying to reconcile, but I haven't let them. They've been trying to repent, but I haven't let them. You ever done that? <laughs> what we just did here with forgiveness is just a little piece of freedom prayer. It's a little piece of what we do in freedom prayer where somebody signs up and says, hey, I, I want to I come together and I want to meet with you and I just want to see where God might take this. And there's three people that pray for you and they come into a setting and it's very just calm and safe and we have a little worship music going on and we just ask God questions. We ask God questions. He's faithful to hear it. It helps us, it, listen, it helps us to develop our hearing and how to hear God and how to do some kingdom business by maybe forgiving or repenting of something, giving, breaking off some entanglements those kind of things. That's freedom prayer. I want to encourage you, if you need to like go a little further here, like there's a pretty big thing lodged in here and you need to go further. If there's something you're carrying, maybe it doesn't have anything to do with forgiveness, if there's something you're carrying you need to be free from, go on our website under the connect tab. There's a place that says freedom prayer. Sign up for freedom prayer. There's a team of about 35 people that are waiting for you to sign up that will sit down and pray through some things with you. They'll pick out a day and a time and we'll get a team that'll come in. It'll be a couple weeks and we'll be able to sit down and pray through something together. Amen? Amen. Why don't you stand with me this morning? Leaders change the culture by being great listeners and demonstrating love. Leaders change the culture by being great listeners and demonstrating love. Heavenly Father, I pray, Lord, that as we leave this place, God, I ask you that you would give us opportunities this week to listen. Holy Spirit, will you stir within us this, like, thing that's counter to the culture that we would be able to lead by listening? Lord, I pray that you'd help us just be intentional to find somebody to sit down with with the only, only intentionality would be to ask questions and listen. Lord, help us to learn and develop our listening, Lord, so that we can display genuine love in our culture. Lord, we know, God, that our city will be made livable when it's transformed by your love. Lord, help us to love well by listening well. Help us to lead in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank the Lord for his word today. <laughs> Praise God. As you leave today, if you want to drop your connection cards, your offering on the way out, if you want to make a first fruits offering this week as well, you can respond to that. If you need prayer, there'll be people down front to pray with you right now. Be blessed. Have a tremendous week.